Good afternoon, and for many of you. Uh, yes, so my name is Ye Tian. Um, my background is medicine, so I'm also a trained psychiatrist. Um, I recently completed my PhD um, and started postdoc research at the University of Melbourne in Australia. Um, yeah, indeed, other side of the world. Um, it is really wonderful to be part of this subcourted workshop. And I will mainly present um, my recent work on mapping the functional architecture of the human subcortex. Uh, so this work was part of my PhD, um, and I was supervised by Andrew Zelaski. Um, he will join the discussion later. Um, so this work, as you can see on this slide, uh, is featured on the front cover uh, of the November issue last year. Um, I so I designed this cover uh, based on human, the human subcortex we created using functional MRI from more than a thousand people. Just as an overview, uh, this work unveils a quite complex organization architecture of the subcortex um, that comprises four hierarchical scales, in which scale one, as you can see on the left side, uh, we capture the well-known anatomical nuclei, those major nuclei in the subcortex, whereas the scale four on the right side has 27 new functional regions. Um, and so I believe that many of you have become quite familiar with the structure and or microstructure property of the subcortex after the sessions in the last two days. Uh, so what I will cover today it will be from a more functional perspective and from a, a, at a larger scale in terms of uh, in the context of whole brain connectivity or whole brain network. So I will introduce uh, the technique of gradientography we developed to characterize the functional connectivity gradients in the subcortex. I will show how the multi-scale subcortex atlas was delineated and the differences between the group consensus atlas and personalized atlases and individualized. I will also show the um, how functional boundaries dynamically change in response to changing cognitive demands during task conditions. I will also show uh, the relationship between subcortical topography and the cortical networks, as well as how subcortical uh, connectivity relate to human behaviors. So before I go on, I would like to note that uh, due to the current limitation in functional MRI, especially the spatial resolution, and also um, like we have two millimeter isotropic resolution is much bigger compared to uh, Susan and Harbour just presented. So some other like a small middle nuclei, uh, middle brain nuclei or some small nuclei such as subthalamic nucleus and substantial nigra, they were not included in this study. We only look into major subcortical regions, including stratum, salamus, amygdala and hippocampus. So some an anatomist might say hippocampus is not part of the subcortex. Um, we'll leave that for discussion. Um, I just go ahead. So here I added this slide just in case some of you may not be very familiar with functional MRI or the concept of functional connectivity. So fMRI measures brain activation over time. Um, so we often call it functional MRI time series. We can either look at local activation in a region like region A, region B, here are the both signals or functional MRI signals, a time series, or from a larger scale, we look at functional coupling between those two signals. So the functional coupling is often what we call functional connectivity, which is um, expressed as temporal correlation or simply Pearson correlation of time series between two regions. So if the person is at rest, we refer to it resting state functional connectivity, and that's the main modality we used in this study. But if the person is at task condition, which means they were asked to do some um, cognitive task during the scan, uh, we, we refer to that like functional connective during task evolved conditions, and that's what we compare uh, later. Okay, so to understand the topographic organization of the subcortex, we first map the functional connectivity between each uh, subcortical voxel and the, all the gray matter voxels in the brain. So this resulted in a connectivity profile for each subcortical voxel, indicating how this particular subcortical part is connected to, uh, to the whole brain. And the functional connectivity 
yeah, as I mentioned, is 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 mapped at rest. Okay, then after we have the functional connectivity profile for each subcortical voxel, we can do next is to quantify the similarity in the whole brain connectivity profile between each pair of subcortical voxels. And traditional way to map the spatial layout uh, of the connectivity variation is to using clustering method to group uh, voxels with similar uh, property into groups. And they, but this is under the assumption that the brain is always organized into discrete patches. And each uh, cluster uh, is, each cluster re represents a distinct subregion, like for example, in whatever brain region. However, uh, some recent studies of cortical gradients proposed the idea that the brain, uh, especially spatial variation in the brain might be better conceptualized in terms of a set of continuous gradients of graduate change in the absence of distinct boundaries. So shall we consider discrete boundaries or continuous gradients or maybe a little bit both? So to understand the subcortex, we, we borrowed the idea from cortical gradients and to map the spatial variation in the functional connectivity across the topography of the subcortex. <laughs> Sorry. <coughs> in principle, uh, we should be able to delineate a hot boundary <coughs> when the spatial variation is significantly large. And in this work, we refer to this kind of question as model selection. And then I will, that's the principle we used to, to map the atlas. And I will talk about that in detail later. And you see, as shown, and let's go back to the slides. As shown on the slide, we use the eigen decomposition method called Laplacian eigen maps to transform the high dimension, high dimensional similarity matrix matrix into a few low dimension. Um, so each computed eigen vector, as I show here in the matrix, represents a dimension of connectivity differences across the spatial extent of the subcortex as color coded in each of the computed eigen maps. I will primarily focus on the uh, on the first principal gradient in this talk, as it, is, it explains, as you can see from the curve, the majority of the variance. Um, other gradients are also presented in, in the article, um, so feel free to read, read about it or if you want to discuss about it. Okay, now here we have the principal gradient map, the eigen map. We call that gradient one, just to, uh, easier. And to better categorize the connectivity gradient, we developed a technique called gradientography. Uh, this is how it works. Uh, we estimated the gradient orientation for each subcortical voxel. Uh, so you can see those arrows, that's the gradient orientation or direction for each subcortical voxel according to the egg map. <coughs> And then we can fit tensor into the estimated gradient field. And as shown here, the, um, if you look closely, uh, the, the shape along the long axis of the tensor is corresponds to, to the direction, gradient direction, whereas the length of the tensor is represented, uh, so, whereas the magnet, gradient magnitude is represented by the length of the tensor. So by doing this, what we can do is to, so we can, so millions of string lines can be propagated in the, in the tensor field uh, in the same way as traditional uh, white matter chartography is typically performed in diffusion imaging. Um, but here, we, we use quite standard chartography algorithm, but what we proposed is a chartography that is based on the connectivity gradient. So we simply name it gradientography. And as you can see here, each string line represents a trajectory or maximum change in the eigen map. So here we color the uh, the string line based on the gradient magnitude of each voxel and the brighter color like red place and those places locations with circumscribed red band like like like, like here they indicate um, um like which means here the gradient magnitude is very large so which suggests uh, a potential functional transition functional boundary here and the, so as you can see here, the, the, the method of gradientography, it enables not only a striking visualization of the, um, of the brain gradients, but also enable us to, 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 to map, to identify the gradient magnitude peaks or sharp transitions. And if we take a closer look, and here are the string lines that travel through um, basal ganglia 
and we can see transitions with very bright color, remember? Bright transition between globus pallidus, filtrum, mucus combens, and caudate. And if we parameterize such transitions, we can see the three peaks correspond to locations of the sharp transition. And we can see the similar thing in the, in the ventral part where the string lines travel past um, uh, left, right salamus, uh, hippocampus, and amygdala. Similar, similarly, we can see more local peaks in the diverse curves. So now the question is, shall we consider all the local peaks? Um, to what extent the, 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 the extent of the, of the gradient magnitude local transition is perhaps just driven by chance or other compounds such as a very typical spatial smoothing during fMRI pre-processing or the geometric contraction that is inherent to subcortex anatomy, especially like here. So to control those um, potential compound, com compounds, we developed a null model. We think that is necessary. Um, so the gradient magnitude mapped from the null model is presented in gray, as you can see on the, on the figure. And the idea is that we, we only draw um, a hard boundary when empirical gradient magnitude is significantly larger than what would be expected from a null model, such that the null can be rejected. Um, otherwise, we argue that the spatial variation in functional connectivity at that particular location is best represented as a continuum in the absence of, um, of discrete boundaries. So this is the idea of model selection um, I mentioned earlier, which is the principle we use in this study. So the model selection process uh, yielded an initial constellation for the subcortex with eight bilateral regions, uh, which means 60 in total. So that you can see that they corresponded quite well with no major anatomical nuclei or subcortic region. What we can do next is to we map the gradient magnitude for each of the 16 regions and also uh, perform the model selection for each of the re regions. We do that <coughs> recursively until the null cannot be further rejected. And as you can see here, the parcellation ends at scale four uh, because um, the null cannot re re reject it, as I mentioned. So, but if you look closely, um, let's say you will find not all subcortical structure comprises four scales. Uh, for example, here, the globus pallidus, uh, we only see uh, the globus pallidus only extends to scale two. Whereas if you look at hippocampus and salamus, they extend further comprising four scales. So we think that this is consistent with the greater functional and organizational complexity within the salamus and the hippocampus in contrast to the perhaps more specific role of globus pallidus in the regulation of movement control. <coughs> Sorry. Okay, um, having generated the uh, parcellation, uh, we next try to test whether whether our the parcels delineated in our atlas were homogeneous in terms of brain activation, because homogeneity is one of the fundamental principles in the studies of in, in the brain parcellation studies. So to do that, we estimated uh, the homogeneity of our parcellation, for example, scale one, and compared to a set of random parcellations. Um, as well as several existing parcellations as uh, subcortical atlases. And here's evidence to show that here, yeah, our parcellation is, is significantly more homogeneous um, than random parcellations overall, eh? um, and also <clears throat> outperformed several existing uh, subcortical atlases to know that the connectivity-based atlas for subcortical is relatively rare compared to uh, we will have a few uh, existing studies, not, not like the cortical analysis, that many. So when we compare to the several existing connectivity-based parcellations, our, our atlas also outperformed uh, those ones, including some specific atlas to hippocampus, salamus, and a stratum, as well as two atlases, uh, including the entire subcortex. Uh, we also replicate replicated our persuasion using 70 fMRI data. So the, our, major, uh, our primary data were from seven Tesla MRI scanner. We also replicated in using a higher uh, magnetic field. And as you can see here, here I just show example comparison of scale one uh, across the two uh, magnetic fields. They are quite um, consistent. And if you look at this plot, 
we find very high special correspondence, our special agreement between 30 and 70 across this all across all four scales and also significantly all higher than the comparison to random populations. And even though I didn't show here, <coughs> I, I want to know that despite the high spatial correspondence, some additional boundaries in amygdala and hippocampus could be identified uh, with 70 um, at finer scales. Um, perhaps we can go to the you can go to the article to 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 get some details. And uh, we think this was perhaps because benefited from better spatial resolution and contrast to noise ratio uh, in 70 compared to 30. Okay, <clears throat> so at this stage, we only examined parcellation based on group consensus data. Um, we would also like to know whether <coughs> the group consensus parcellation is representative of individuals. Um, so this is of high practical importance, quite important, we think, uh, because individual specific atlas could potentially enable, in, for example, improved personalization of targeted clinical therapies like, like the brain stimulation, as people talk, talk about that. Um, and here is an example of personalized striatum atlas with two individuals, uh, two example individuals, one with high dice coefficient, one with low dice coefficient, coefficient when compared to the group atlases. So the higher the dice coefficient, the larger the, the extent of spatial agreement between the individual one and the, and the group one. So you can see the variation, even though they are matched relatively well, but you can see the variation in the um, a specific boundaries um, in individual persuasion compared to the group. Um, to be able, able to have a, to get a more comprehensive overview of how the individual persuasion look, I showed two examples of two regions. Um, show the distribution of the dice coefficient of the two regions. One is dorsal posterior put, and another one is hippocampal body across individuals. So overall, you can see on average, dice coefficient is quite high, which means um, the individual atlas is quite relatively consistent with the group one. But so which means they are perhaps for, for, for them, the group atlas should be um, sufficient to represent their functional architecture. But you can see there are small proportion of individual that at the very end of the tail. So for those individuals, a personalized atlas might be more needed. This might be because of their very different functional connectivity, or and this may also relate to perhaps the division in their anatomy, or they might have some very distinct cognitive or personality traits. Uh, we, we didn't get the chance to look into that further, but I hope uh, future work could cover this. So overall, our results suggest that in most cases, our group atlas is sufficient to represent a healthy population because they all, sorry, they all from the Human Connector Project healthy young adults um, and can be used, for example, to, to build a normative um, connectron. And here, just to be recap, um, so we used 3T and 7T functional MRI from more than a thousand people to map one of the uh, most detailed functional analysis of the female subcortex. Um, we personalized the subcortex to better shoot the potential application in precise, me precise medicine. Uh, and this atlas could facilitate whole brain connectome mapping and targeted therapies in, for example, neuropsychiatry. And in the front, front now, uh, in the rest of the talk, I will provide some more insight into the functional organization of the female subcortex as I highlighted three here. So, okay, so this atlas was mapped primarily using the resting state function MRI, as I mentioned before, when the person uh, was at rest without doing any tasks. And to understand whether the functional architecture of the, of the support at rest could potentially dynamically change in response to changing cognitive demands, were further mapped to connectivity gradients um, in, different, in seven different task conditions, including um, as at least here, the emotion task, gambling, language, motor execution, relational, social inference, as well as working memory tasks. Um, so I only show the two diverse curves as in this, using the same protocol we map diverse curves by, by from the computed gradient, uh, connectivity gradient. As shown in the curve, you can see, um, so those two curves are from two resting state sessions. They are highly consistent. 
but you could see the deviation to a certain extent from the uh, task conditions. So um, I just show some example, they look com complicated. Uh, but if you look here, the, the putman here, in, in task conditions, the anterior putman, <laughs> excuse me, <coughs> integrate more extensively with nucleus compounds and cordage, which are more associated with high order cognitive function in principle. And in contrast, if I um, look at the ventral part, the hippocampus, uh, which is here, during task condition, the hippocampus was more uh, segregated along its long axis, uh, see the high peak here, resulting in a more integrated anterior um, hippocampal system that may have served emotional regulation, as well as a more posterior hip hippocampus and salamus system, we think that might potentially benefit to the learning and special memory, for example. And these dynamics may, we think, may reflect, uh, uh, like, for example, for um, like self-regulation in the brain to better cope with complex or uh, very high cognitive demands uh, as in the task compared to the rest. Okay, so here re regarding the relationship between subcortical topography and cortical networks, uh, a more intuitive notion or typical notion is that each subcortical region is perhaps part of a cortical network. However, from our work, we couldn't find very strong evidence to, to, to support this um, notion. Instead, uh, we found that a subcortical region is often connected to multiple cortical networks without very uh, distinguishable preference. Uh, if we focus or focus on the cortical network, uh, when we map the connection between cortex and each uh, cortical network and the subcortical re region, instead we found that the cortical networks can be arranged along an um, intrinsic organizational axis from the established task positive to task negative axis based on similarity in patterns of connectivity with um, subcortical regions. So instead of from cortex to subcortex, we, we mapped um, otherwise. So I show some example between the, 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 the connectivity of, of cortical and subcortical. As you can see here, the regions in the task positive network is preferentially connected to um, salamus, um, salamus um, and the striatum, especially the dorsal striatum. The sensory motor network is is most strongly connected to hippocampus as well as amygdala, um, also posterior salamus. Um, similarly, the default mode network is more connected, or mostly connect, strongly connected to hippocampus as well, as well um, and also uh, some moderate connection with posterior salamus and also and 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 the cordate. Um, finally. Uh, I would like to, uh, so, so we use this subcortex atlas and then we use atlas to uncover uh, a, a novel relationship between subcortical connectivity and human behaviors. So here, to enable to map the brain behavior relationship, we first use a data-driven approach to, to derive five broad behavior dimensions from a large set of behavior items, um, over a hundred. So the five dimensions um, characterize individual variation in cognition, some illicit substance use, tobacco use, personality, emotion, as well as mental health traits. Um, and the most important, uh, most significant finding is the relationship between subcortical connectivity and tobacco use. So look across all four scales, individual with lower functional connectivity between salamocordate, salamus, and nucleus cumbens, and hippocampal nucleus cumbens circuits um, associated with higher tobacco use. And this finding is quite reproducible uh, across four positive scales and also across data sessions. And I think it's also consistent with the role of subcortex in the brain reward system. Um, I only find a significant finding with tobacco use. So I want to note that uh, because here we only look at connectivity and subcortical subcortical connectivity in this work. Uh, so we didn't find, I didn't find a significant association with other uh, behavior dimensions. So, which means that future work. So I think future work with whole brain connect or map mapping and better calculation of cortical and subcortical connectivity should be able to give more insight um, into the 
brain behavior associations, uh, especially the high order cognitive function that is quite unique to human beings. Um, okay, um, here's I want to acknowledge here. Uh, so this is pretty much the overview of this work and um, please check out for details in the paper or reach out if you have any questions. Um, so this atlas is publicly available and I have also integrated the subcortex atlas to several cortex cortical atlases to enable um, whole brain connection mapping. So you can download them from either GitHub or NITRC. And also there are some code to, to map the gradientography and um, any pipe, uh, the whole pi pipeline, the code is also available on GitHub. Um, okay, so I would like to thank my um, previous PhD supervisor, Andrew Zorowski, um, uh, supervising this work. I would like, also like to thank Michael and Daniel for their contributions. Um, this is a joint work with them. Um, I would like to thank all the participants um, in the Human Connection Project and their generosity to make all the imaging data publicly available, which is great. Um, and thanks, especially as a, a, um, a special thank to to the organizing committee uh, for this workshop, which is amazing. Uh, thanks everyone for your attention. Um, and both Andrew and I, Andrew is here as well, will be happy to take questions. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, 